Thanks, it's nice to be here. I'm James Malone, I'm a product manager and I work in Google Cloud. Uh, and generally I really have an affinity for working on products that are, are based or involve open source. Um, and today what I wanna do is talk through Apache Beam together with Spark, kind of give an introduction to Beam, show you how you can run Beam pipelines and also just Spark in general on Google Cloud Platform and then uh, questions and, and such. Um, since this is a bit of a short talk, if you have a lot of questions, uh, we have a booth downstairs, there's a Google Cloud booth. Um, I will be there and you can pepper me with questions. So first, let's take a really quick overview of Apache Beam. So a long, long time ago, Google wrote the MapReduce paper and kind of branched that technology off and continued developing a whole bunch of technologies that were kind of an evolution of MapReduce. And at the same time, Google was releasing papers on what they did, and that influenced the development of kind of a lot of the open source community or things that you find in the Apache ecosystem. As a result, Google actually has two products that are focused on batch and stream processing in cloud. One is Google Cloud Dataflow, which is based on kind of all of the innovations that Google has developed to run itself and Google products. And then we have Google Cloud Dataproc, which is our managed Spark and Hadoop service. What we really want to do with Apache Beam, and one of the goals of Apache Beam within Google is to really try and unify these two divergent train, train tracks. So, what is Beam? Well, at its core, Beam is a model, and Beam is designed for batch and stream processing. It's designed for both batch and stream processing as a first class use case, so you don't have to think about batch or streaming. The model is inherently designed and is designed from the start to really think about both. So to really think about Beam, there's one concept which is really good to start with, and that is event time and processing time. And in an ideal case, if you are generating data, you will process that data immediately when it's generated. Unfortunately, that's usually not how reality works out. So here we have an event time, which is the uh, x-axis, and processing time, which is the y-axis. If everything were perfect, you would see a completely linear uh, event and processing time distribution. But you don't here. Um, in one case, for example, event nine was processed about seven minutes after it was originated. So you're handling out of order data and data at different periods of time, which can be quite tricky when you're thinking about stream processing. So to really think and reason about these, the Beam model kind of asks a few important questions. First, what are the results that you want calculated? Second, where in event time do you actually process those re results? Third, when are the results actually materialized, and how do you handle refinements to that data? And I'm gonna walk through what all of these look like, and the Beam model is really designed to address these questions head on. So first, what is being computed? Well, let's take just an example hypothetical use case where we want to process data from a mobile application, and we wanna add up scores on a team. So here is a very simple example where we're just going to sum all of the scores as we, as we get the scores. So you can see that in this animated graph, we just have a, a window in this case, it's arbitrary 10 minutes, and we're just summing the scores. At the end of the window, we, our batch is complete, and we have our results. So very, very simple use case. But we can make it a bit more kind of complicated and more complex with Beam. Uh, second, we can think about windowing. So instead of waiting for that giant bucket or just running one batch, let's think about can we actually sum these maybe every two minutes? Well, in Beam, you can do that quite easily. So in this case, you can see that we're summing all of the scores and we're windowing it by two minutes. But again, we're not actually emitting the results until the whole batch is complete. So a step in the right direction, but it still has its flaws because we're waiting for the data to be emitted. So third thing we wanna think about is when can we actually trigger these events or when can we start emitting results? And to do this, Beam has a concept of a watermark and you can use this watermark to emit results as they come in. And it's really just a, it's a heuristic. It's a best case guess on when it thinks that all of the data has been received. So in this hypothetical use case, you can see that we're calculating the data, we're grouping it into two minute windows, and we're emitting results when it thinks that, when the heuristic thinks that all the results have arrived. Uh, there's one result here in this example that arrives late and is not factored into the results. So obviously if we're thinking about a mobile analytics game, slightly less than an ideal use case because that person's data is just not in the computation. 
So how do we refine the data when we process it? So with Beam, you can easily add uh, refinements when the data is arriving either early on time or late. So in this case, you can see, and this is uh, the actual Beam uh, code, it's very, very expressive and simple. So in this case, we're going to emit results as soon as we think they're ready, but also handle updates to results once they are uh, emitted late. So in this case, you can see that that score nine uh, was in fact late, but we go ahead and actually emit a new result with the updated score. So in just a few lines of Beam, you can actually do something which is fairly complicated. In this case, it would just be summing up scores. Uh, but the model is designed to really think about this and things like this uh, as its core use case. So just as a whirlwind example, we went through what was realistically a very simple batch to a windowed batch to a streaming application, and then uh, finally a streaming application where we have accumulating data so we can handle late events or early events. So ultimately, what is Beam? Beam itself is the model, which I roughly walked through, uh, and I apologize, I can't do it justice, but we only have 15 minutes. Uh, it's a set of SDKs for creating those pipelines. So there is a Java SDK and a Python SDK. And then there's a set of runners, and the runners are where you actually can go run your, your Beam pipelines. So ultimately, in this end vision with Beam, and this is a really core important point of why we've gone down the road with Beam in the first place, is we really want to think about three users. One, it's, there's the end users. These are people that want to write data pipelines. Second, we want to think about SDK writers, people that are actually going and creating SDKs. Uh, for example, uh, some of our uh, friends and colleagues at Spotify have been writing a Scala veneer for Beam uh, because they love Scala. Uh, we want to think about them as a first-class citizen. And third, runner writers. So these, it's really important. These pipelines ideally are portable between runtime environments. So you could run them on a service like Google Cloud Dataflow, or you just runners for Spark, Flink, uh, Apex. We want this pipeline to be portable between different runners. It gets a little bit messy sometimes because the runners uh, themselves or the runtime environments all have slightly different semantics. So uh, there's a compatibility matrix on the, on the Beam website if you're curious. Uh, and this is continually updated as both the runtime environments and also Beam itself changes. Um, so some things are supported across all runners. Other things work just in specific runners. But the goal is to maximize portability. And if you're articulating a Beam pipeline, Ideally, you won't have to worry so much about uh, either upgrades in a core technology uh, or feeling like you're locked into a particular environment. So that's a whirlwind just overview of Beam. Um, if you are curious about Beam, there's some links that I will uh, point to at the end. But let's talk about how you could actually run a Beam pipeline on Google Cloud Platform. So with the Spark, ecosystem, we try to really fix this. And this is usually what a lot of uh, Spark and Hadoop deployments look like. They take a really long time, and they generally suck. Uh, scaling is usually very difficult. Uh, if you're trying to think about utilization, you have to you know, study the economics of your cluster to try and properly utilize your cluster. Ephemerality can be hard to achieve. Uh, and cost can be extreme. Uh, you're often not paying for exactly what you use. We want things to be seamless. So scaling, we want scaling to be an afterthought. We don't want you to have to worry about utilization. If you don't need the resource, simply don't leave it on. Um, and people always give me a weird look, but if you're not using a service, don't pay us money just to let it run. Like, keep your money and go buy other things. Um, don't pay for an idle cluster. Ultimately, we want you to pay for exactly what you use. Uh, so to do that, we created a product, which I'll talk about in a second, called Google Cloud Data Proc. Um, and we try to think about kind of mapping the open source ecosystem to some of our products in Google Cloud. Cloud Data Proc is uh, really at its core kind of a managed Yarn service. So a lot of the things that you would run on Yarn can run on Cloud Data Proc. We ultimately want Spark and Hadoop. Uh, and this is true if you're running Beam on Flink or running Beam on Spark on Dataproc. We want it to be fast, easy, and cost effective. Uh, ideally, when you go to create a cluster, we want to give you that cluster in about 90 seconds. If you want to delete that cluster, we also want to tear that cluster down in about 90 seconds. Uh, we also develop a whole set of connectors for the Spark ecosystem on Google Cloud Platform, so you can use Google Cloud Storage, or BigQuery, or Bigtable. 
Uh, we've really tried to make it very easy to use and not super customized, uh, or rather we don't try and tinker with the underlying open source. So we're not trying to change Spark in ways that actually make it really hard to uh, exit Cloud Data Proc. Uh, realistically, if you're writing like, some simple PySpark, uh, you should just have to update a URI prefix for your code and you should be good to go. Under the hood, now this is unfortunately a little blurry. Um, it looks kind of like 1996. Uh, under the hood, Cloud Data Proc runs on Compute Engine VMs, so it looks and feels very much like a traditional Spark and Hadoop cluster. Uh, we have a set of agents and control planes uh, that run on those workers. Uh, you can also, because of that, use things like preemptible virtual machines, which is a special concept, or custom virtual machines in Google Cloud to lower your compute costs. Uh, we build our own open source image using Apache Big Top. Um, it's actually very similar to what uh, Amazon EMR does at this point as well. Um, and since at its core it's a managed yarn service, you can run a whole bunch of things on Cloud Data Proc, including Beam Pipelines. Uh, I won't demo them because we don't really have a lot of time, uh, but there's several ways to actually use Cloud Data Proc. So if you went and created a Beam Pipeline, uh, there's several ways that you could actually submit that Beam Pipeline to a Cloud Data Proc cluster. Uh, one is just the web console. It's our web UI for Google Cloud. We also have a, they call it the Cloud SDK, but really it's like the Google Cloud command line. It's the G Cloud command and all of those tools. Um, so for example, if you wanted to run a Beam Pipeline as a Spark job, uh, the command in the lower left-hand corner is just submitting a Spark job to a cluster. So it's very easy to go interact with that cluster. You don't have to use... Um, you, know, you don't have to like open an SSH window and use Spark Submit uh, or worry about you know, leaving your laptop open so you can see the output. Um, we wrap all of the cluster interactions with both a cluster API and a job API. Uh, you can also do a whole bunch of interesting things with Cloud Data Proc clusters. Um, so aside from just treating it like a normal Spark and Hadoop cluster, uh, there's uh, people that have used the API to build things like Spidera, which was recently uh, released by Spotify to essentially ephemerally create clusters like Spark clusters. Um, it's actually a really cool project. I would highly recommend checking it out if that is the sort of thing that interests you. Um, other customers use things like Airflow. Um, and we've recently started contributing to Airflow as well. So ultimately, if you wanted to run Beam on Google Cloud Platform, and I apologize, this may be slightly, slightly blurry here. So just to give an example, the, it's very, very blurry. Uh, my apologies. This is going to be a bit small. OK. So if you wanted to run a Beam pipeline on Google Cloud Platform and get started, it's super easy. Or if you wanted to use Spark on Google Cloud Platform, it's super, super easy. Uh, I'm in the web UI for Google Cloud Platform. Uh, if I wanted to, for example, create a Spark cluster, we try to make it essentially one click. So you would name your cluster. You would choose a zone on where you want your cluster to be created. You can configure the cluster, so you can use uh, different machine types. You can do things like enable high availability, which gives you an odd number of masters uh, for Yarn and HDFS high availability. Um, and you can kind of tweak the quest cluster a little bit. Um, from the web UI, the command line gives you a whole lot more options. Uh, but the web UI is designed to really get you up and running quickly. So if you developed the best Beam pipeline in the world and you wanted to run it on Google Cloud Platform, uh, aside from running it on Cloud Dataflow, which natively supports Beam itself, uh, you could run it on Spark or Flink on Dataproc. And once I create this cluster, it will go and uh, just create the cluster behind the scenes. Um, since we integrate pretty deeply with all of the components on the cluster, we can do things like stream driver output to the tooling that we have. Uh, we can scale clusters up and down while they're actually running and doing work, so we don't have to like decommission uh, or pause a cluster. Um, and use things like preemptible instances, so you can lower your compute costs. And Dataproc will handle the, instant, the preemptible instances randomly kind of coming and going in your cluster. And that's about it. If there are any questions, I have 50 seconds for questions. Uh, otherwise, if uh, there are more questions, I'm happy to, to answer questions uh, downstairs. Cool. All right. Thank you guys very much. All right. Thank you, James.